So before I'm introducing um, our speaker of today, I would like to give you a very few, like a very brief introduction to the HEAL community of practice and what we're trying to do, to do uh, with these um, webinars. So as you can see, the, oh, you can go back to our slide, sorry, Salva. The, the One Health for HEAL project um, is, consists of a consortium of three organizations. So we have Veterinaire Sans Frontières Suisse, who is the lead um, institution of this consortium. Then we have ILRI involved. Um, and we have a public health NGO, CCM, Comitato Collaborazione Medica from, from Italy, who covers the, the public health side um, consortium. ILRI is doing a lot of the cross-cutting issues and also brings in the natural resource management and VSF Switzerland um, is, is also responsible for the animal health, but also brings in extensive experience in pastoralist systems. So I'm going to talk to you briefly about what this uh, project aims to do, so we can move to the next slide. So the overall goal, oh, now I need to wait for the slide to come. So what we aim to achieve with the One Health for Heal project is to have enhanced well-being and resilience to shock of vulnerable communities in pastoralist and agro-pastoralist areas in the Horn of Africa. So we try to address this by looking or, or, or changing systems at a different level. So we work with the communities on the ground um, and engage them in defining the solutions. So to, to address some of the key challenges that they face. Um, and then we also work with the service providers in the area to set up One Health units for service delivery and test models on how to operationalize them. And last but not least, uh, we also aim that the, these One Health units are recognized as a solution for service delivery. So with this, we aim to address some of the key challenges in pastoralist areas, and that really is access to services and have holistic solutions that are accessible for the communities. And I think we haven't mentioned it on the first slide, what HEAL actually stands for. So HEAL stands for Humans, Environments, Animals, and Livelihoods. So you see a really um, comprehensive approach. So maybe the next slide. As part of this third goal, that the HEAL One Health units are recognized as a solution for service delivery in the long term, we have established a community of practice and these seminars as we have here now is one of the ways um, to achieve this. Um, Saba, have you moved to the next slide? Ah, okay, here it is. Okay, so, so instead of just showing what the HEAL project is doing and how the One Health units can be operated on the ground in Ethiopia, Somalia, and Kenya. We thought it is good to have a platform where different One Health practitioners representing different stakeholder groups can share their experience. And through that, we can have a, a learning platform over time. Um, so through this community of practice, we want to document evidences and lessons learned. Uh, we also aim to facilitate coordination with other One Health initiatives. There is a lot of One Health activities going on in different parts of the world, but also in the Horn of Africa. So better understanding what others are doing and also hearing from them how they are finding solutions, I think will be beneficial for everyone. Um, and I think we also... Um, so we hope that really this helps, that, that we have this community of practice, that we get the different practitioners working together. That includes social scientists, environmental scientists, veterinarians, um, 
the representatives from the human health, but also that we have maybe farmer organizations that can be present here. We have the research community, um, but we also have the policymakers uh, represented here. And this community of practice is coordinated jointly with the ILRI One Health Research Education and Outreach Center for Africa. So this is really, we see that as a, as a joint effort. Next slide, please. So as uh, before we move to, to the webinar, um, here a uh, sort of <laughs> code of conduct, just that you know we will record this presentation and the recording will be posted on the HEAL website uh, and through our HEAL YouTube channel. So over time, there will be a whole repository of presentations for you to look at in case you want to miss the seminars or if, there's, if you have seen one that is particularly interesting and you know of people that would like to see it. So you can always refer them to this uh, HEAL YouTube channel so that they can watch it. Um, I would like to encourage you to use the chat function, so also to interact with other participants here in the room and, or to ask questions. And I think it uh, goes without saying um, that we re respect opinions um, of everybody who is online here. In terms of code of contact, please mute your microphones when not speaking. Um, and as I said before, use the chat functions to ask questions. So um, with that, I would like to thank you for participating and for being with us today um, for this second webinar. And with that, I would like to move to the next slide. So that you also see, yeah, okay, <laughs> who we are going to talk to today. So I have the huge pleasure um, to introduce our speaker for today, um, that's Dr. Matthew Mukuri, um, who is co-director of the Synoptic Disease Unit in Kenya. And I'm especially pleased to have him here because when we talk about One Health and operationalizing One Health and in all sorts of projects that have a One Health focus, policy always comes up as important. And it's always sort of say, oh, we have to involve policymaker, policy dialogue is important, etc. cetera. And, and this always comes up. So I'm particularly pleased that actually we have somebody here today to talk to us about how to institutionalize One Health from, from a government perspective. And I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from experiences that have been made in Kenya. Um, and so I'm particularly pleased to have Matthew with us today to talk us through and to share his experiences so that we actually don't make the mistakes or don't repeat mistakes from the past. And as you have seen, Matthew, we have an audience from different parts of the world or representing different organizations. So they will all be very interested to hear what you have to say with us and share with us today. With that, I would like to hand over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Barbara, for the kind words and for the introduction. So um, as said by Barbara, my name is Matthew Muturi. I work uh, at the Zoonotic Disease Unit and the Directorate of Veterinary Services in Kenya. So I represent the Director of Veterinary Services at the One Health Unit. And uh, as Barbara said today, the focus of my talk is basically sharing some of the lessons and challenges we've learned with the uh, implementation of One Health in Kenya and hopefully um, help other people in different countries um, learn from our mistakes and also gain from our lessons. So um, the talk, uh, uh, Saba, if you could go to the next slide, please. I was struggling to, to change it in my computer. So thanks, thanks for that. So um, the ZDU where I work is uh, Kenya's One Health Office formed between the line ministers of human and animal health uh, in Kenya. 
It was established in 2012 through a memorandum of understanding between the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Livestock and Agriculture then. Uh, we have a structural office, so it's a formal One Health office with a structure within the Kenyatta National Hospital grounds. Uh, that's uh, in Nairobi, uh, right next to the HIV referral training center. Currently, we are two epidemiologists. There's a vet uh, epidemiologist, myself. There's a medical epidemiologist called Dr. Motondo, and uh, one admi uh, admin assistant at the, uh, at the unit. However, we receive a lot of support from field epidemiology and uh, lab, lab training program residents. So this is an uh, in-service training where we have uh, medical doctors and vets trained together. So uh, we at least get four residents attached to the unit every year, and they're very uh, useful to our work. And uh, we call other experts on a need to be basis. So, as I said, we are two uh, primarily we, it's human and animal health, but uh, for the environmental sector, we call uh, experts who we need depending on the event we are working on at the time. And I'll explain this in uh, further as I go to uh, the other slides. Uh, Saba, please. So um, this is a picture from the launch of the ZDU in 2012. So the picture on the left shows the two ministers of uh, uh, the human and animal health ministries then. So it's the, the guy to the, life, to the left should be the minister of uh, livestock development in 2012. And I think the minister of health uh, in the, on the right. And this was the formal launch of the office. And um, the picture on the right is the office uh, to date where uh, we sit uh, at the ZTU. Next slide, Saba. <clears throat> So um, it has been quite a journey to the establishment of the ZDU, a uh, seven-year journey to be precise. And it all started in January 2005 uh, with the H5N1 global threat. At the time, the WHO recommended that countries should form national influenza task forces to tackle um, the particular events. And this was supposed to be multi-sectorial in nature. And so we had people from the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry, uh, people from the Ministry of Health coming together to coordinate response to the threat at the time. However, this was an ad hoc group that quickly disintegrated when the threat diminished and everybody went their separate ways. But in 2006, there was a RVF outbreak, an explosive outbreak then. I think it's one of the biggest we've had so far. And the same people who are in the NIT came together to form a zoonotic technical working group that would coordinate response to the RVF outbreak. And um, Again, it was an ad hoc group that disintegrated uh, until August 2008. Again, at the time, I think there was a threat of uh, RVF outbreak. And they decided instead of sort of breaking up and meeting only when there are uh, specific events, um, they should start meeting quarterly. So there's not a direct working group then started meeting every uh, three months. However, two years later, um, they decided instead of meeting every time, um, every quarter, and sometimes missing meetings, what about forming a One Health office that will meet on that will work on a daily basis? So, a One Health office that is dedicated to working um, continuously together. And um, this idea was mooted in a, a multi-sectorial workshop in uh, September of uh, 2010. And two years later, again, quite some time, um, the ZDU was uh, formally launched uh, and then as uh, One Health Strategic Plan was also launched at the same time. So as you can see, it's been quite a process to the uh, establishment of the units. Saba, next slide, please. <coughs> Um, so to guide, to explain how the unit works, and I think this is quite important because uh, I've worked in many countries where the setup of the One Health Office is quite different. Uh, the ZDU is unique in that it's set at the technical ministry level. So um, unlike most countries where the One Health Offices are placed at the prime minister level, ours is much lower in government, has its own advantages and disadvantages, but... Um, which I think I can mention later, but I think we have a very good setup in that we are able to work together on a daily basis, as I mentioned, and we receive direct support from the ministries. So at the top level, we report to the director of veterinary services and the director of medical uh, services. And the two directors chair a zoonotic technical working group, which is basically a committee of One Health stakeholders in Kenya, both international and national. And uh, this, 
zoonotic technical working group uh, is designed to coordinate the work of the ZTU. So a lot of the work we do is mandated by this technical working group and we serve as a secretariat to this technical working group. Um, so however, uh, horizontally we report to the head of veterinary and, and veterinary epidemiology and economic section in the Ministry of Agriculture and the head, of, uh, the head of the Department of Preventive and Promotive Health in the Ministry of Health. So this is at the national level. However, at the county level, we have tried to decentralize One Health by forming functional One Health units. We call them County One Health units. They're not structural like the ZDU, so we don't build them offices. Uh, however, we train people on One Health, bring them together, uh, train them on the One Health agenda, what they need to do, and um, I'll explain how this is done in subsequent slides and the other challenges we've, we've faced in establishing these units. However, it's important to mention that Although we are two uh, epidemiologists, as I mentioned, human and animal health, we co-opt other experts on a need basis. Um, I'll mention this later, but uh, one of the challenges you find that is the environmental sector is quite broad. You know, there are diverse specialists. You have a zoologist, sometimes you need ecologists, you need climatologists, you need public health experts, environmental experts in public health. And so uh, we quickly realized you cannot have one person to basically serve the entire environmental sector. So we decided it, the best approach is for us to co opt experts depending on the event we are working on. And so, uh, Saba, you can go to the next slide. I'll explain how this is done in the subsequent slides. So um, to guide our work at the unit, as a One Health strategic plan was launched in 2012, as I mentioned, uh, it was supposed to run for five years, but we renewed the mandate of the strategic plan for another three years, up to 2020. Uh, we actually have a new strategic plan that's supposed to be launched this year, but because of COVID, uh, the COVID-19 outbreak, we have deferred that to early next year, hopefully. And uh, the zoonotic uh, the ZDU strategic plan had three main thematic areas. One is to strengthen surveillance, prevention, and control of zoonosis. Number two is, is to establish structures and partnerships to prom conduct to promote One Health. And uh, number three is to conduct, conduct and promote applied research to make uh, data on One Health more better and more available. And um, the ZDU mission is to establish and maintain active collaboration on the animal-human ecosystem interface towards better prevention and control of zoonotic diseases. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, and, and I know this will come up, uh, at the time we were launched as a zoonotic disease unit, but I must mention the deliberate efforts to sort of broaden our mandate to One Health by bringing other players like AMR on board and uh, hopefully in the next presentation we'll be giving, we'll be talking as a much, much broader unit as opposed to just a unit working on zoonotic diseases. Saba, please. So um, the next slides uh, will talk about successes of the One Health approach in Kenya and some of the challenges we faced. And uh, Saba, you can go to the next slide. So I'll start with the successes. I think it's only natural to start with the good things then I'll talk about some of the challenges later. So um, I'll discuss the, the successes and the challenges in using the same thematic areas. So for example, the first thematic area I'll talk about is joint surveillance and response. And at this, I think one of the most uh, biggest successes we've had is the uh, development of a joint priority zoonotic disease list uh, between the Ministry of Human Health, Ministry of Environment, and the Ministry of uh, Agriculture. And uh, these are the top five zoonotic diseases in Kenya. Uh, this was developed using a US CDC tool that uh, ass assigns weights to certain criteria, and the, the criteria are shown on the right. We used five criteria to assign to determine which are the priorities not take diseases. Uh, and this list, however, is due for review again. It's supposed to be reviewed this year, but I will review uh, it uh, hopefully uh, early next year. And I just have to mention that um, the human trips, I, I know this will definitely come up and I've been asked before why it ranks so highly, but as I said, it's because we were assigning weights to certain criteria and uh, human trips scored very highly because of the severity of the disease that score. So that's why it came up so high because it's a very severe disease in humans. Uh, Saba, next slide. I keep on pressing the keyboard uh, to move to the next slide. So, um, Part of the reasons the WHO, um, I don't know uh, how many of us are aware of the WHO, IHR, JEE uh, tool. 
uh, WHO recommends, that's WHO and OI recommends that uh, once you prioritize zoonotic uh, diseases, the whole plan is to um, make sure that you, you, you promote joint response to uh, the diseases that are listed in your priority list. So this is a case study I want to share of joint response to a zoonotic disease event. There was a major outbreak of anthrax in livestock, humans, and uh, wildlife uh, at the shared, in, in a shared space. And um, uh, we responded jointly. We had a huge team with this, uh, wildlife disease ecologists. Uh, we even involved soil experts because we wanted to study why these outbreaks are occurring in the same space. We had uh, medical epidemiologists, livestock uh, disease experts. And this is a case study, a very good example of the importance of, of joint response. And we were able to publish a paper that can reference uh, what we did and what we learned. Next slide. Um, and. Uh, Next slide, Saba. And uh, joint surveillance and response. I think, yes, under joint surveillance and response, one of the key recommendations by uh, so that you adhere to the international health regulations is to develop joint contingency plans and guidelines for priority zoonotic diseases. Actually, if you look at the WHO JEE tool, the Joint External Evaluation Tool, one of the things Kenya was told is we need to develop contingency plans for the top five, top four priority zoonotic diseases. And I'm happy that we have um, we have been able to. Um, start to, to develop uh, this for some of these diseases. We have uh, joint CPs for brucellosis, anthrax. And when I say joint, I mean formed between multiple sectors and, valid and accepted and validated by multiple sectors. We have a joint CP for brucellosis, anthrax, Rift Valley fever, rabies, avian influenza. And we also have multiple guidelines to guide uh, response to outbreak events. So we have response guidelines to outbreaks, joint response to outbreaks, and public health events of initially unknown etiology. And these are the pictures, the two pictures show two uh, of the CPs that we are currently implementing. Next slide, uh, Seba. Seba. <clears throat> so I, I put in this because I know um, one health, uh, COVID-19 currently is a topical issue. And this is a classic example of how One Health has worked in Kenya. We did a small survey among uh, field epidemiology lab training program residents in Kenya, and we asked um, how many of them are involved in COVID response. And it was of interest to us that quite a number of veterinary officers are involved in contact tracing and uh, data analysis for uh, the COVID response by the Ministry of Health. Besides the um, technical support, the DVS, the Director of Veterinary Services, has provided a lot of material support to the Ministry of Health and uh, also I think it's important to mention that we are extremely proud and happy that IRRI, which is primarily a livestock institute, is providing uh, technical support to the Ministry of Health in terms of testing and I think uh, just part of the reason is a good relation, working relationship that existed between the two ministries. Uh, Saba, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, next slide again. Um, so, and, uh, okay, yeah. So um, the next thematic area I want to talk about is establishment of structures to promote One Health. I think this is extremely important uh, because um, we want One Health to sort of be in, integrated into the public health system as opposed to be, you know, something ad hoc or something that's not structured in policy. And so we have over the last few years tried to establish structures to promote One Health. Um, we have done this through policy level engagement, um, talking to the people who sign the big checks, you know, uh, people who are involved in policy making. So we have a policy advocacy strategy that we use to uh, learn, uh, sort of guide us in engaging the policy makers. Um, the other uh, activity that we have done, which to me, I think I consider the most successful um, in pushing the One Health Agenda in Kenya is the FETP training. So field epidemiology and lab training program training. So in Kenya, I think it's quite unique because we have um, quite a number of veterinary officers who go, who are trained in epidemiology with uh, people from other cadres. And this is extremely helpful in breaking barriers when it comes to, uh, you know, um, breaking silo mentality and how people work. So I think over the years, up to 100 veterinarians have been trained um, in One Health uh, at different levels. So they train um, 
part of the FATP training, they, they do One Health trainings for people at, at different levels of government. And I think this is, has been extremely important in sort of making people work together. Because what happens if you end up in two years in um, class with, for example, as a veterinarian with a medical officer and you're learning epidemiology together for two, three years, at the end of the day, it helps really in breaking down barriers. So when these people go back to their counties in, lead, in positions of leadership, we've seen um, big uh, difference in how they work together. And also we have done county level trainings on One Health. Um, and I think the next slide will talk about this. We've also established structures to promote One Health through regional collaboration. Kenya currently, uh, or the ZDU currently leads the East Africa Rabies Network. We're also involved in the uh, planning and um, uh, implementation of the Africa One Health Congress that happened in last year in South Africa. And um, the other activities we do in establishing these structures is to have event-specific technical working groups. So in the past, we used to have the Zenotic Technical Working Group meeting every quarter, uh, but we found based on experience, it's more effective to have event-specific technical working groups. And an example is we had a technical working group meeting two weeks ago to discuss um, an event that was occurring in Camels. Uh, we had these outbreaks of unknown etiology in Camels. And so we called for a technical working group, multiple stakeholders, including the Ministry of Health, and uh, sort of to guide us on how to do the response. Next slide, uh, Sabo. So um, I wanted to, I, I put a specific slide on county level one health units because um, this is one of the most significant challenges we faced. Uh, so a lot of the times you are told, um, One Health is working well at the national level, but is it really replicated at the, at the lower level? And I, I think I need to mention for those who might not know that Kenya has a devolved system of governance where they, we have 47 independent counties and they're in charge of uh, veterinary and health services are devolved and even environmental health services, their responsibility of the independent county governments. And so what we do is we try and train counties on uh, formation of, we train them on One Health and we have a standard uh, curriculum where we train them on how to do, to implement One Health and form functional One Health units because we don't have the resources to build them specific offices. So what we do basically to form this One Health units is we bring together the county veterinary officers, county disease surveillance coordinators from the Ministry of Health or public health officers, uh, and then if they are, for example, depending on the um, region, if, for example, there are wildlife in the region, we bring together the wildlife coordinators, people in charge of wildlife health. If there are no wildlife, we get somebody who's in charge of the environmental sector in the region, and we take them through a one-week training where the, the main themes are joint outbreak investigation, uh, in data sharing, and we we provide tools for data sharing and we train them on things like joint risk assessment. And after the end of the five day training, we basically leave them with tools that can help them share data. We tell them what they need to you know, how to meet, uh, what to discuss, how to implement One Health. But um, again, as, as I discussed the challenges, I'll, I'll discuss some of the issues we are facing with this. A map on the right shows some of the counties we have trained on One Health over the years. I think this was up to 2018, and this is a published paper. So um, you can reference it and study more on how we do this training and some of the challenges we face. Next slide, Sabah. So um, when the unit started, we re quickly realized that one of the challenges is uh, there's very lim limited data on uh, some of the zoonotic, priority to zoonotic diseases. And uh, it was decided that um, the need for, to have operational research is will be one of the key thematic areas in the strategic plan. And this just shows some of the partners that we have worked with throughout the years in multiple research projects. But I want to give a, a specific example, Saba, next slide, of um, uh, a, a project we are working on, the ZDU is leading, and it is a very good example of how multiple partners can collaborate to uh, have to, to generate good data on some of the drivers of zoonotic diseases and uh, One Health in general. And um, we have a co-infection project that uh, ZDU is leading with multiple partners, including including ILRI, 
uh, oh, funny I forgot the early logo there, <laughs> but uh, we're implementing this with the University of Nairobi, Washington State University, Kenya Medical Research Institute, Los Almos Lab in the US, KWS and uh, IRRI, as I said. And the whole uh, project is looking at co-infections at the human livestock and uh, wildlife interface. So this is a very good uh, case study of uh, One Health collaboration uh, in, in research. Saba, next slide. Um, I threw in this here uh, because um, I, this is one of the experiences we've had in, and we quickly realized that um, you can use um, specific zoonostic diseases depending on the region to drive awareness on One Health. And so what we do at the ZDU is every year since the beginning of 2017, we try and organize a rabies marathon um, on the week of the, the rabies week, that's the September of 22nd, uh, just before World Rabies Day. And we quickly realized, although the whole idea of the marathons was to raise awareness on, on rabies, uh, it, it provides a golden opportunity to talk, talk about One Health. And uh, as you know, politicians and policymakers enjoy crowds. So when you have big crowds, for example, when you're organizing marathons, it provides a very good opportunity for you to also sell your One Health agenda. And I thought it's important to put this in. Fortunately for this year, I don't think we'll have a marathon, um, but anyway, it's an opportunity to make it bigger next year. Uh, Saba, next slide. <clears throat> So um, now that I've mentioned some of the successes, I think that there was just so much to talk about, but I, I focused on what I think would be important on this talk. And of course, with successes come challenges. And um, the first one I want to talk about is resources. Um, and this, I think, is uh, I think it's always a challenge in a lot of the work we do. Um, if you compare, for example, most of the zoonotic diseases we work on versus what we call the big three in Kenya, HIV, malaria, and TB, uh, we have significant uh, challenges with funding, both from uh, government level. Again, a lot of these are not diseases that allow, attract a lot of funding, uh, rabies, for example. And so we have uh, significant challenges in pushing you know, the One Health Agenda um, at lower levels, because some of the drivers, as I said, are not considered very important compared with other much bigger diseases, for lack of a better word. And again, the resources is not just the limitation in funding, but also the way the government system is set up. As I said, we have a devolved system of government. And the funding is very sector specific. So the Ministry of Health has its online budget. The Ministry of Agriculture has its online budget. And sometimes getting these sectors to work together and commingle, commingle funding, especially at lower levels, is a significant challenge. So we are talking about joint outbreak investigations, for example. Um, who provides, you know, what portion does the Ministry of Health provide? What portion does the Ministry of Agriculture provide? You know, so that are some of the questions, especially at lower levels. Uh, but although this is a challenge, I must say, at a national level, um, we have sort of been able to surpass this. Uh, the Director of Veterinary Services has has no problem providing funding, for example, to people from the Ministry of Health to join outbreak investigations. And we've done this multiple times. And the Ministry of Health has no challenge in providing uh, you know, support, for example, to, to veterinarians and ZTU to do certain events. However, at lower levels, uh, this is a significant challenge. Uh, the devolved governance system, uh, as I said, Kenya, the counties are independent. And so, um, you cannot force anyone to implement the One Health approach. You have to, you know, it's basically advocacy, trainings. A lot of the times we train people, they move away. <laughs> There's nothing we can do, they, they are moved. Or... So, you know, this is, this is a challenge because a lot of these counties are independent. You find, um, I can give examples of two counties in Northern Kenya where one county has multiple, you know, has a lot of veterinarians, has enough public health officers. So it's very easy to dedicate people who can sort of push the One Health agenda. Then you go to a next county that has probably very few staff. And again, you're training them on One Health, adding more work for them, you know, telling them to have these joint meetings every week. So there's that difference and it's very hard to implement a standard approach. Um, the other challenge is limited data on key drivers of One Health. Um, you know, one Health sort of a new agenda. So uh, a lot of the times when we are meeting governors or 
people who make the main decisions at county level in government, they really don't know what One Health is. So you have to keep on raising awareness. And um, as we all know in government, policymakers understand dollar figures, they understand monetary terms. And so one of the key things we miss is, for example, showing the cost benefit analysis of One Health. We've been asked, for example, one person asked us, we've been doing these things, you know, in a particular way since the 1960s, why again, what's the main thing with working together? And um, again, we, we try and as much as possible try and explain what's the, why should we implement one health? And getting at least the cost benefit analysis of this uh, sometimes is, is a challenge. And again, um, the other limitation we get with uh, availability on data of key drivers on one health, of course, is data. So we have a lot of research, for example, on, on zoonotic diseases, but very limited re, uh, data on other aspects of zoonotic diseases. For example, the socioeconomic impact of some of these diseases. And so it becomes a challenge to try and show why uh, people should work together to um, eliminate some of these uh, conditions we have. And, the other challenge is, uh, and I think this comes up everywhere, the ZDU uh, is <laughs> uh, the environmental sector. Why, for example, we don't have a person, full-time person from the environmental sector at the office. And as I said, we've realized, we have tried before, but we quickly realized that the environmental sector has diverse specialities. Um, you know, depending on the event, the condition, for example, if it's RVF, you might need somebody who's an expert in crematology, you, you might need an expert who's in zoology, you need an expert in uh, multiple fields, right? And so a lot of the times we ask ourselves, is it who's the one person who can sort of try and bring all this together? At the national level, it's not very difficult to get some of this expertise. And a lot of these people are phone call away. But at the lower levels, we get significant challenges in getting you know, people from the environmental sector who we can train to push this agenda. Um, the other challenge is, of course, lack of very strong policy framework. We have tried to establish a One Health policy, but as most of us know, government processes are very long and bureaucratic. And uh, the other challenge we, we face is the shift in governance. You know, so you, we have tried, for example, to have certain counties implement a One Health policy at county level, sort of One Health guidelines. But you, you realize you train, person, you train a person, you're talking to a minister in charge of health, a minister in terms of agriculture, and then suddenly they are shifted. You have to restart the process. And so that's one of the other challenges we face. Saba, next slide, please. Um, again, implementing One Health at the community level, um, one of the challenges, again, we face, as I said, is a high staff turnover. Counties, as I mentioned, are independent. So we've had instances where you train people today on One Health, you train them why they should collaborate, how to cooperate, how to share data. The next time you go, they have been moved to different places. And because this is... Um, um, not under your control, again, you, you face, you, it, we must take it as a challenge. And so we, on, the only thing we do is we try and talk to some of the county leadership, not to move around the people we, we've trained or we give, to give them an opportunity to work in One Health. But as I said, uh, it's not up to you. And so um, sometimes it can get a little bit frustrating. Um, at community level, we try and train community health workers on One Health. And um, we have tried this with specific projects, for example, in Western Kenya. Um, but we quickly learned, uh, there's a saying that they, they say the bees follow the honey. So the problem we, we face is we have, for example, a lot of these community health, they are actually called community health volunteers because they, they are not paid by anyone. But a lot of specific programs on TB, malaria, and HIV have funding to pay them to implement HIV programs, for example, at community level. And so um, sometimes you go, you're talking to them about One Health, you know, zoonotic diseases, you're talking about anthrax and rabies, and then, you know, big checks come in the name of TB, malaria, and you find as much as they are pushing your agenda, they're, they're really focused on, you know, where the money is coming from. And so, yeah, I had to mention that as a challenge. Um, the other challenge is coordination of multiple partners. 
Um, ideally, the ZDU, we're supposed to be working with multiple partners under the Zootic Technic Working Group to you know, work together in implementing One Health and to build a sustainable approach. But sometimes you find that uh, we are sort of, because of uh, the difficulties in coordination, some people, partners have their own interests, others choose to, especially now that we have a devolved system of governance, some people go directly to counties and, you know, um, do trainings, do their own things. And you find over time, if you look at the, some of this, there, you know, some of counties keep on getting the same support over and over and over. And um, basically it's, it's um, not the right thing, but again, this is a challenge in that, you know, you cannot force anybody to come to the table, but what we try is to try and persuade the importance of you know, synergy and working together. And this is, for example, the Hill Project is an example of three partners who are working together as opposed to Hillary going their own way training, CCM doing their own thing, ZDU, you have AID. So we have so many partners and all we request partners to do is come to the table with the DVS MOH, not because of anything, but just to make sure that we are not sort of um, doing the same thing in the same places and we are actually having tangible impact. Next slide, Sabo. Um, So besides the challenges, and the challenges are many, but I try to summarize them. Some of the lessons learned, I think, uh, which is important for countries that are trying to implement the One Health Agenda is there's no one size fits all approach. You have to understand and adapt. Different uh, regions will, um, uh, in, will accept One Health depending on the approach you use, right? So that's what I mean by region specific drivers. Of one health. So, what will work in Northern Kenya will not work in Central Kenya. So what we try and do is identify what is the driver of One Health that these people consider important and that they will sort of um, uh, embrace if we use that approach. So for example, in Northern Kenya, because it's a lot of people are passive, um, if you use the uh, zoonotic disease agenda and diseases that affect the pastoral system, you sort of, uh, you know, it, it's, it's easier to understand and embrace as opposed to talking to something that they do not really know, right? And so, for example, if you're going to central Kenya where diseases like anthrax are a big issue, we use anthrax as a case study to train about One Health. So that's what I mean by identifying region-specific drivers of One Health. And in other countries, because we've, we've been lucky to have the opportunity to work in different countries. In other countries, you find zoonotic diseases are not such a big issue. Uh, you find, for example, something like antimicrobial resistance is a bigger issue. So you use that particular agenda to drive um, the one health approach. Um, sustainability. Working in government, I think this is extremely important. Uh, we need to move away from the project as a systems approach. You find that One Health is a topical issue. So there's a lot of One Health, you know, interest in One Health, there's a lot of funding. And so we find um, a lot of project-based uh, uh, approaches as opposed to systems approach. And what I mean by a systems approach is making sure that you are you're involving the government, the policy makers um, in implementation of your of, of, of your projects throughout. You know, that's what I mean by genuine. A lot of the times you find partners who come when they're starting, they tell you, oh, we are working together, we are doing this. But immediately these projects take off. Um, you don't know what happens. And then you are they come back after three, four years after the project that ended with the reports. And a lot of the times those reports end up somewhere at the shelf, uh, dust somewhere. But however, if for example, you're working with a county and you're involving the county personnel throughout, you're making sure they're in the loop, it's sort of easier to transition and sell their agenda genuinely to them. So that's what we mean by um, working on a systems approach as opposed to project approach. And the other thing, for example, is, uh, working to you know, um, develop documents that can be used long-term. For example, guidelines on One Health, training curriculums. Right now, I think we are, I got some document from CCM where we're reviewing on a One Health curriculum. That's something that's long-term. Even if CCM exit the scene, you know, five years, 10 years later, we still have that curriculum. So you know, long-term approaches are, are quite important in, in implementation of One Health. Then um, operational research. 
um, there's a saying that uh, policymakers don't read papers, <laughs> don't read manuscripts, and we need to sort of move from uh, manuscripts to policy statements. So basically focusing on research that's solving public health problems. And if I could give an example is um, the, the fact that some of, uh, we do a lot of research work on the burden of disease, but there's very little, for example, the socioeconomics uh, burden of disease that can give us figures that we can use with policymakers. And I'm glad, for example, in the co-infection project, besides looking at the burden, we're looking at more, for example, the social aspects of disease, the economic aspects, and this is what we use to drive the policy agenda. So um, moving from man manuscripts to policy statements is quite important in One Health. Um, I believe this should be the last slide. Uh, Saba, I think, oh no, I have one more. So what exactly is a successful One Health approach at local and national level? To us, it is better coordination between sectors and I've defined what better coordination is. Um, improving the capacity in animal and environmental health for better detection, prevention and control and uh, driving research at the human animal environmental interface. So um, that to us, I think if you try and achieve these three points, you will be basically uh, successful in some way in implementing One Health. I believe this is the last slide, uh, Saba, um, but Yes, so I put this picture here because it's quite interesting. We did an investigation to camel, camel uh, a disease uh, outbreak in camels of a known etiology, and we quickly realized that some pastoralists, um, if they do not have access to veterinary drugs, they go to hospital, access human antibiotics, and they use this to treat camels. And this is a, a pastoralist who had multiple uh, uh, oxytetracycline tablets. Um, and you know they show you it's, it's all part of uh, survival if if they don't have these services they'll do anything to 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 make sure that the animals are well and survive but again if, if you look at it in the bigger context this again will bring other issues and so um just shows you the importance of making sure that there's a lot of collaboration at that level to minimize some of the challenges so with that this should be my last slide and i hand over to barbara thank you <laughs> Thank you so much, Matthew, on behalf of everybody who is online. I think this was a fantastic overview of, and a lot of food for thought. So for me, some, some takeaway messages really were that genuine government involvement right from the start is key. And I really like the overview you presented about the success factor so that we have to focus on communality so that there is something to win for everybody involved and that this can be achieved through joint action. So actually doing something instead of only talking about it. Um, so I think that that was really useful. Um, so be it in terms of joint zoonotic disease responses or developing joint contingency plans. And I also would like to reiterate the point you made about having structures that promote One Health, which could be done through training programs such as FETPD or, or FETP or, or others. So I think that was hugely um, useful. Um, we've had quite a few questions coming in from the audience. So maybe we quickly go through that. We maybe have another five or 10 minutes, um, but I'm aware that some people will have to leave shortly. Uh, so we had a question from, from Ethiopia, from Darsema, um, asking about um, whether the two epidemiologists and the admin staff, whether they are full-time assigned for One Health to, to work in the CDU. Yes, full-time okay. working. Full-time working. Okay, that's very good. I think that's probably something of interest for, for Ethiopia also to think about. I think that's why this question came up. And then we had a question from, from Christina, who unfortunately just had to leave a couple of minutes ago. And she was asking about the funding resources from the CDU. So where, where are the funds coming from? And I think it's related to a point you made of one of the challenges as well about funding for One Health. Can you comment a bit further on that? So the funding is both from government. Um, for example, our office is run by government, our salaries are paid by government, and also we receive uh, significant support from different partners. So it's both government and partners. 
Okay. And then we also had a question from Martin Barraza from VSF, but I think he already had to leave as well. So I'll ask it on his behalf. Um, so he wanted to, to sort of know a bit more about from Martin Barraza from VSF, but I think he already had to leave as well. So I'll ask it on his behalf. Um, so he wanted to, to sort of know a bit more about the linkages and coordination uh, between actors in the humanitarian and private service sectors. So are you aware of any linkages or frameworks to coordinate activities of the humanitarian sector and the private sector? So the, the Zoonotic Technical Working Group um, that I presented um, is actually, uh, it's an open membership group for both uh, uh, people who work in private services or human. It's basically open to anybody who is interested in. Okay. Uh, in there. Okay, so, and then we had a question from Klaas and let me check if he's, Klaas, you're still here. So maybe you can ask it yourself. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Barbara. I was wondering, um, because it was mentioned that there is uh, like joint surveillance is, is one of the activities that you that you conduct and in how far in general surveillance data is handled in, in Kenya, in how far the veterinary sector has access to the public health surveillance data and vice versa, or if that is even captured in one database. Because that's a question we, we often face in, in different areas where we want to implement One Health, um, that basically it's, it's really difficult for the, for the one sector to even know what's going on and what uh, information regarding disease occurrence is available on the other side, let's call it. So since you have a unit there that already brings it together, does this coming together also relate to the data? So the answer is no, um, and, and I'll give a reason for this. Um, we quickly realized, we tried to have a joint database, um, but we quickly realized that this is adding more work to some of the surveillance officers that we trained on One Health. And so we realized that instead of forming or establishing independent sort of surveillance and reporting structures, uh, what we insist on is data sharing. So we, we, they report independently, but we give full access to uh, these databases to officers uh, at, at any level. So for example, I work for the Director of Veterinary Services, but I have full access to Ministry of Health data uh, and vice versa. And, and we make sure that this is available even for county personnel if they need any access. Uh, it's, it's available full-time as opposed to having a joint database, which we found would be a bit uh, expensive to try and operationalize because you have to do trainings, you have to design new electronic tools. So we took um, the easier route to make sure that data is shared instead. Okay. Good, I think that might be something for the future to consider. Um, talking about data and surveillance, so maybe I'll just move to Mohan, who had a question regarding surveillance and um, aquatic animals. Mohan, please go ahead. Well, thank you. Very, very nice presentation, and I really like the frameworks which you presented on joint surveillance, joint uh, emergency planning, contingency planning. I'm assuming that aquatic systems and aquatic animals are considered under. Uh, Animals and veterinary services. That's my first question. And second question for a sampling uh, uh, frame: Would you consider a landscape which is shared commonly between all these uh, uh, elements which we are interested, in, like people, animals, uh, fish, whatever? You know, will that be an approach, or will it be sort of again uh, isolated surveillances, but then bringing together the data? Thank you. And so to answer your first question, aquatic systems and animals are considered, uh, that they are considered under animal veterinary services. Um, sorry, I missed your second question. Could you repeat that again, if you don't mind? When, when we do a surveillance uh, sampling frame, would you use a landscape type of an approach which considers an area which is sort of uh, cohabited by people, animals, water that way, or is it then trying to join them together in terms of the data. So it's 
when it comes to surveillance, the, it's, as I mentioned, the surveillance is done independently along the uh, different uh, human and health systems and the data is co-opted uh, or rather shared at, after analysis is done at the analysis level. I don't know if I answered your question, but that's what I understood. Okay, so maybe we move on to the next question. So, so Mohan was, was okay with that answer. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Lisa had a question also about funding. Lisa, do you wanna go ahead, please? Hello, thank you. Um, yeah, it was actually related to the first question from Christina. And uh, in my mind, I wanted also maybe clarification about practically when there's field uh, investigation to handle, outbreak investigation and emergency, for example, uh, do you have a specific fund at the ZDU level or is it the counties uh, that do that? Um, and I have a side question if it's possible also. Do you have any contact with your counterparts uh, in other countries, for example, Uganda or Ethiopia, for specific diseases like RVF that I'm curious to know if there is some discussion going on at a broader level also. Thank you. So, um... To answer your first question, uh, the, the way the ZDU is set up, we are under, as I said, we are a technical office at um, ministerial level. So we do not have our own budget line. However, um, the divisions under which we are sit, uh, uh, as, uh, the, the, the divisions under which we operate have a budget line that we easily access whenever we have outbreaks. So that's, so that's how the Kenya government system is set up. So if, for example, I need funding for outbreak response, all I need to do is do a request and I'll have the access uh, to this funding. And uh, this, just to add on, um, the good thing with this funding a lot of the times is um, even if it's it's for a joint outbreak investigation, we've had instances where, for example, the director of veterinary services will fund an entire outbreak investigation, and another time it's the Ministry of Health. Um, to answer your second question, yes, we do have linkages with One Health offices uh, in in other countries, but um, to be honest, these are not structured or formal linkages. I think it's because a lot of the times we know these people, so. Most of them are friends, so we're able to talk. We have tried to establish, for example, an East Africa uh, sort of One Health uh, community, uh, but it's sort of ad hoc, to be honest. But we do have linkages on it. If I need them or if I need any information, I'll, I'll easily access it, but mostly on a person-to-person -person basis. Okay, thank you very much for this. Um, we had another question from Arshni and I think she's still here. Arshni, do you want to go ahead? Um, yes, thank you, Barbara. Hi, Matthew. Um, so the question I had, and, and it comes through in your presentation, this, you educate people and then they move on to better uh, jobs or they is restructuring. And so one of the questions that I had was this, if you incorporated it at, into their degrees while they you know, becoming a medical doctor or a veterinarian, is there a push to sort of incorporate the One Health curriculum at that level and then having it reinforced throughout their uh, uh, sort of, their, while they're attaining their degree so that when they do go out in the world that they already have this in mind or built into their DNA? Thank you. Um, Spot on, nationally. That's what what uh, we've realized that it's it's actually more sustainable to integrate this into the curriculum of higher learning institutions. It's something we are working on and we are pushing. And um, there are some universities that are actually trying. The University of Nairobi, Med and Vet School, uh, through other programs like Oshare, who are actually implementing these trainings for undergrad students. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. And I think we have one last question from somebody who I don't know the name uh, because he appears as Galaxy Tab 2, but you have raised your hand. So maybe you want to go ahead and, and ask your question. No? Okay, maybe that was fine. But you're muted in case I, I can try to unmute you. But. Hello? Okay. Yes, hello. Please go ahead. Yes, Please Dr. Adano. Yeah. Dr. Adano Kochi. Oh, hello. Hi. 
Kenya, Director of Health at the Marsabit County, Kenya, bordering Ethiopia. Ah, yeah, we saw you before. Please go ahead with your question. Uh, yes, it's not a question, but a comment. And thank you very much, Dr. Muturi, for your presentation. Uh, I think he has raised a very important uh, issue here when it comes to the one health at the county level. As the Chief Technical Officer in the Department of Human Health, we know that the counties are not yet ready to commit so much resources uh, in, in the, to, to, to the one health uh, function because of other competing needs. Like most of these pastoral counties have got uh, high maternal mortalities, so many other morbidities that are infectious, and they are way overloaded by other uh, development responsibilities. So it will be a long time for us at the county to realize that the response from the county government in terms of One Health funding. That is one. My other no, uh, notice uh, in your final, uh, final, uh, final uh, slide, you showed us the oxytetracycline pills that are used for livestock uh, treatment. I think this is one other side of One Health. Probably we have not captured. We might be just think, be thinking on only disease alone, uh, the infections alone, cross infection between animals and human, but there are other contaminants that are also dangerous, which are coming on board. That is, animals are given drugs, be it the veterinary issue or the human issue, and nobody, uh, most of these people consume uh, the products, whether it is meat or milk, immediately. Uh, some of these drugs, like let's say the oxytetracycline, could be an underdose that is given to an animal. And what can emerge is a superbug because of the resistance that are coming that can be also dangerous in future. Uh, in terms of milking, people are using things like heated plastic, which we know poses dangers. And, and by itself is another side now, which is coming into one health issue as a contaminant that are going to cause diseases like cancer. This is some of the things now we need to also bring aboard when we are addressing One Health. Uh, that is just a contribution for the future. Thank you so much. Hello. Yes, thank you very much for these reflections. Very useful indeed. Um, and, and it's also important to, to keep in mind at the local level, absolutely. So I think we, I can't see any raised hand. Oh, we had one more question. Okay, it was about the conclusion of the camel outbreak investigation that you did, because there also had been some outbreaks in Somalia. Does anybody want to comment on that, the conclusions of the camel outbreak investigations in Kenya? I, I could comment yes. on that. So yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we have a final report that um, we did uh, from the outbreak investigation. Um, I could share this with Farah Issa, um, and, and I don't know okay. if he could send me a private message with his email. Um, but anyway, because it's public information, we got, uh, and we did this in collaboration with Ilri, uh, we discovered the pathogen causing uh, the mortalities was uh, Manhemia hemolytica. It's a strain of Pasteurella. And so um, I could uh, advise him on the what we learned about the antibiotics to use and how to respond to the event. If you just send me his email, I'll share the report. Okay, thank you. Um, Farah, I hope that was helpful for you. So if you let us know your email address, uh, Matthew can pass on the final report from this outbreak investigation. So I think with that, we would like to conclude for today. We run over a little bit of time, but I would like to thank you all very much for your engagement, for the First of all, most of all, to Matthew for a fantastic presentation and then to all the participants for their contributions to the discussion. So I think that was really useful and very insightful for all. Wish you all a very nice day. Thank you. Bye bye.